Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you all this morning at New Harvest United Methodist Church, and good morning to all of those out there at home watching online. We hope we're getting through this morning without any problems. Uh, it's a beautiful morning inside. It's kind of yucky looking outside, but it gives us a chance to concentrate more on God. Let's look at our announcements, and thank you. We have a bulletin again, finally. We're back to doing a bulletin. And if you need something in the bulletin, you'll have to let us know early in the week, please. Um, tonight, we're starting our new Bible study. And with a new Bible study, we have a new time. We're going to gather at 5.30. This is in person. We are spread out. We wear our masks. And we'll be studying the book of Luke. So come join us if you're interested in studying the book of Luke. Um, I'm going to add, I have already contacted the members of the PPR committee. This is just a reminder, 6 o'clock tomorrow evening here at the church, PPR committee. Administrative board, don't forget our November 2nd meeting. The rest of the bulletins are here in the in the. The announcements are in the bulletin. Are there any announcements from the floor this morning? Okay, hearing none, let's move into our worship. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Take your Methodist hymnal, turn to number 452. As we sing, my faith looks up to thee, 452. Let's unite together in our affirmation of faith as the Apostles' Creed is found at number 881 in the back of the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. continue our worship by joining in in prayer together and I invite you if you have any prayer request that you would like to bring before us if you raise your raise your hand or just call out and let's get those uh, get those prayer requests in we'll continue of course we'll remember Brian uh, Brian Mullis uh, and Verley Simpson No, and I, there's Eddie Bynum's here with us this morning. Good to have you back, Eddie. You know, I Well, it's great to have you here, Eddie. Good to be back. I have two my sister in law, Joanne Nussbaum, unexpectedly had to go back to the hospital. Hopefully, she'll get home first of the week. Uh, and my brother in law, Tommy Devane, my sister Alice's uh, husband, he's having some blood pressure. Thank you, Susan. Others that y'all have lived up this morning. All right, let's pray together. Almighty and gracious God, it is a special privilege that we always recognize to come before you. That you, the, the creator, master of the universe, care so for each one of us all of us together and each of us individually so much you love us so deeply that you want us for yourself and you draw us and you call us all the time into that relationship with you that you made us for from we've not heard you sometimes and we have rebelled against you other times and you keep calling us and we're so very thankful for that help us to hear you and to respond to you in the way that you would have us to respond by running to you as hard as we can go. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and worship you this morning, whether we're doing that in person or remotely. It, we're all in the same worship, the same uh, opportunity that we have to lift up our, our praises and our thanksgivings and our joys and our concerns and the things that are lifting us up and the things that are weighing us down. You, you take them all. You hear them all. Lord, we know that there's so much turmoil in, the, in this country and in the world. And we know without doubt that it's only you that can straighten that mess out. Help us to, to look for you and for your guidance and direction in all things, from the largest things to the smallest things. And to know that, that you're involved in that. You're, in, you're engaged in every detail and there's a path for us in there that's your path. Help us to see it and not turn to the right or to the left, but to stay on it as you call us to do. But we've lifted up particular concerns this morning that we, that we, we call upon you for a special touch of your presence, 
for Brian in the continued healing from his surgery, for Eddie in the continued healing from his surgery, and from Verley as she continues to recover. We pray for Joanne and for Tommy. And Lord, for all the others that we, whose names we hold dear, but haven't spoken aloud, you know them. You know the needs. You know your answers because you've already purposed your answers before we think to ask. Help us to hear you to respond to you in the way that you would have us to respond and to be your hands and feet, to be instruments of your grace in all these situations. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We lift up all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to turn in the back of your hymnal now to page 814 as we read to responsibly from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great ruler above all gods in whose hands are the depths of the earth and also the heights of the mountains. The sea belongs to God who made it, and the dry land because God formed it. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God. We are the people of God's pasture, the sheep of God's hand. Hear the voice of the Lord today. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your forebears tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who err in heart, and they do not regard my ways. Therefore I swore in anger that they should not enter my rest." We continue worship with the presentation of our of our offerings. Uh, as we're not passing the, the plates, but we have the offer the plates at the back of the, of the sanctuary to receive those offerings. Let's pray together over the offerings. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for the gifts that we bring back to you out of the abundance you've given to us. Bless them to the building of your kingdom in your precious name. Amen.
Good morning. It's good to see all of you, uh, those who are worshiping with us in person and those who are joining us uh, online uh, through, the, through the live stream. Uh, we've been working through some, some of the technical glitches, and I hope we're at, at the place now to, today that we've, that we've got this going the right way. <clears throat> we're coming to the end now of this series we've been in where we've been walking very slowly with the people of Israel in the Exodus, in that time when, the, when God pulled them out of slavery in Egypt to restore them to the land that God had promised to their ancestors, to Abraham. I, there are a lot of twists and turns in that story, including the way that their doubts and their fears overcame their faith and turned what should have been a journey of a few weeks into 40 years. We've been concentrating on what this whole story tells us about God because that's who the story is really all about. It's about God and God's fundamental character of love for his people. We're called to join those, that group. We're called to be those people, to join that in that ancient and eternal covenant with God which says, I will be your God and you will be my people. We celebrate God's faithfulness for all time to, the, to his end of the covenant. And we recognize that we remain desperate for the touch of God's grace because we don't do well holding up our end. That's true for us as humanity and as individuals. It's God that's the constant. But last week, we shifted our focus a little bit from the people as a whole to the other main character in the story, and that's Moses. I've been warmed up all week by that image from, that we talked about last week from Exodus 33, 11, of God talking with Moses as a person would talk with a friend. I want that. I hope you want that. And I realize how absolutely awesome it is that God offers that relationship to all of us, each of us, all the time. You know, the people of Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness between Egypt and the promise. That time is sometimes referred to as a time of wandering, but they were not lost God was directing their path the whole time and was using that time in the wilderness to prepare them for what There are some extraordinary themes and lessons around wilderness and exile in that whole history of the, of the people of Israel. Lessons that we can learn from and still apply. Most importantly, lessons about learning to trust God going to come back to those themes at various points through this history. We're going to read this morning about the end of Moses' direct time in that story, and then we're going to look back a little bit. So turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 34. If you have your Bibles with you, it's right about there, way back at the, at the front. It's right at, this is the, the last chapter in Deuteronomy. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. 
Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Who did all these miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This chapter ends what the Jewish people know as the Torah, what we know as the first five books of the Bible. You think about what's there. So Genesis gives us the story of creation and God's covenant promise to Abraham. Exodus recounts the defining event in the history of the people of Israel. Leviticus goes into great detail about worship, helping us to see that God takes worship seriously, and so should we. Numbers follows the people in that long journey through the wilderness. Deuteronomy gives us the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And it concludes with these final teachings and instructions of Moses. To this day, the scroll of the Torah is read in synagogues every year, the whole thing, in an ordered way that ends with a great celebration called Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah. It's a party when they get to the end of it, where the scroll of the Torah is passed from person to person as they sing and dance. The joy is partly about completing that annual reading, but it's also rejoicing that they have this great gift of a word of God and they get to start again. I love what that says to us about the reading of Scripture. How we relate to Scripture. Receiving the Word of God as a gift is a very different thing from reading it as a labor or a duty. That annual cycle of reading the Torah for the Jewish people is not just about studying it. It's about learning it in all of its depth. There are new insights to be gained in it every time we open it, no matter where we open it. A rabbi is quoted here says, One cannot compare one who has learned 100 times to one who has done so for the 101st. Isn't that great? We can learn something here. So writing about the 2020 celebration of Simchat Torah a couple of weeks ago, Rabbi Meyer Soloveitchik said this, The pandemic has made us understand what we often took for granted. How the ability to gather weekly in synagogue and study the Torah together is one of our greatest gifts. And we better appreciate how, in the face of life's trials, <clears throat> it is the book of books that sends us. And Catholic Archbishop Charles Chaput said, The Jewish people continue to exist because their covenant is the foundation and glue of their relationship one another with their past and with their future and the more faithful they are to God's word the more certain they can be of their survival this is the attitude towards scripture that the psalmist is talking about it's psalm 1 blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Moses is revered in all of this as the messenger of God. 
which is what a prophet is. We think, we th hear prophet and prophecy, we think about future telling. But what prophet means, what, the, what prophets are in Scripture is messengers from God, people who are hearing and delivering a word. God gave the law to Moses, who delivered it and interpreted it for the people, including us. In the time of Jesus, the teachers of the law considered themselves to be in the line of Moses. And Moses is held up by the writer of the letter to the Hebrews as one of the greatest examples of the faith. This is from Hebrews chapter 11, where we see a number of different people's faith lifted up as examples. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. That writer knew his history. We could probably tell the story of Moses, too. If we were in Sunday school as children, we learned all this. We learned that, that Moses' parents evaded the command of Pharaoh to kill all the boys that were born to the Hebrews by setting him afloat in the Nile, hoping that someone would rescue him. Somebody did. It was Pharaoh's daughter. Moses was raised in the household of Pharaoh, but he knew he was a Hebrew. One day Moses saw one of the Egyptians beating one of the Hebrews and Moses killed the Egyptian, buried him in the sand. Pharaoh found out about that and sought to have Moses killed himself. But when Moses realized that other people had seen what had happened, he ran for his life to the, out to the Sinai, to the desert. He settled there, married and was tending sheep when God spoke to him out of a burning bush consumed and told him to go back to Pharaoh and demand the release of the Hebrews. Don't forget that it, when that happened, Moses was about 80 years old. Don't forget that. But that begins the story of the Exodus when Moses empowered, when God empowered Moses for spiritual, organizational, military leadership, all kinds of all the leadership he needed. Along the way, Moses assembled all that God had taught him into what we have now as the Torah. On Mount Nebo, as we just read, God gave Moses sight of all of the promised land. If you go there, you can see from the, Mount Nebo is in what's now Jordan. It's on the west, I'm sorry, on the east side of the Jordan River opposite Jericho. So from Jericho, you can see Mount Nebo. From now, Mount Nebo on a clear day, you can see a long way. But you can't see all of what Moses saw without God's sight. God showed Moses with Moses' eyes all of the promised land. And at the end of his life, it's easy for us to see how it would be written that there was never a Moses. Now that was a pretty kind of breathless fast forwarding through the life of Moses. And we know there's a whole lot more to his story. But as we hear it, as we listen to that story of Moses, we get, we get the idea, we come away with that idea that Moses is somehow like larger than life. That he feels like almost unreal, like nobody could actually be all that stuff that Moses was, and his life was certainly way beyond anything we might experience. There's no way God would speak to me out of a burning bush. Really? Why not? Why not? You know, when God put that thought in my head this week, it was pretty startling. 
I was praying for someone for a special touch or reminder of God's presence. And what I heard was, well, how about a voice from a burning bush? And when my initial reaction to that, nah, that's not possible. God said, why not? Well, why not? God's ability to do stuff like that has not diminished. God is the same God who spoke creation into existence with a word, who talked out of a burning bush, who parted the Red Sea, who delivered quail and manna from the sky and water from a rock in the desert and bodily raised Jesus from the dead. God has not stopped speaking. God has not stopped loving us. God has not stopped living out compassion for us. God has not stopped being faithful to his promises. God has not stopped hearing and answering prayer. God has not stopped moving in ways that we can experience only as miracles. We only need to be paying attention to see and know and imagine God doing all of that and infinitely more. The Apostle Paul recognized this. It's something he wrote in his letter to the Ephesians. It is Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So what does all that mean for us? I think there's at least three. There's more, but there's at least three key lessons here. The first one is God can use anybody who's willing to fulfill God's purposes. When we step back from that story of Moses a little bit, It looks like Moses' life was pretty much of a wreck at the point when God called him. He'd gone from eating at the table of Pharaoh to running for his life to tending sheep in the desert that weren't even his. God came to Moses right where he was when he was 80 years old. Moses didn't ask for any of what God did through him. It was all God's idea all God's initiative. But what Moses did ask for was for the presence of God to go with him and before him. And when he asked for that, God says, watch me. Because God was already with him and was already before him. Moses had all kind of objections to what God called him to do. And God answered them all and he overcame them all. Moses also had a temper. He was sometimes impatient family squabbles he had to deal with and occasionally we see him having a pity party but he always returned to the grounding of faith to the assurance that God was with him and before him it just took Moses being willing to be used by God for Moses to experience all of that Second thing is God is not limited by our idea of what answered prayer is. When the people of Israel were fleeing Egypt and they found themselves trapped between the Egyptian army that was chasing them from behind and the Red Sea in front of them, it's hard to imagine that anybody in that bunch figured that the way out of that mess was a path of dry land through the Red Sea. We could survey history, biblical and otherwise, and do example after example of this kind of move of God. God's ways are not our ways, and God's imagination is not limited to ours. The example of Moses here should teach us that what God calls us to do is to believe and follow. That includes believing when what we see is not what we were expecting or hoping for, And it includes following when the path is not where we were expecting or hoping to go. Moses believed and followed when that did not seem like a rational thing to do. Jesus repeated that same message over and over. Believe and follow. Third thing is that God holds nothing back. And he wants all of you. 
I'm still marveling at this idea of God talking with me as a person talks with a friend. That's a deep, personal, intimate relationship with the creator of the universe. And I'm pretty sure it doesn't happen if we hold anything back. God didn't hold anything back from Moses. Jesus didn't hold anything back from us. When he became sin to free us from the power of sin and submitted himself to death to free us from the power of death. Moses held nothing back from God. Even in his weakness and doubt and fear, Moses trusted God from the depth of his being. That's the story of Moses. And it can be the story of us, of each one of us, individually as a congregation, as the church universal, as the people of God. We may not be called to spectacular things, but we are all called every day in the smallest of things and in the greatest of things into that very relationship with God, that intimate, personal, deep, reaching into the depths of our soul relationships, the abundant life now, Perfect in eternity. Are you open to a voice from a burning bush? Why not? Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty and gracious God, open us. Open us to, to, to receive you, to receive your word and all the different ways your word comes to us out of, out of scripture and out of creation and out of all the different ways that you speak to us now. Help us to hear you. To hear you calling us, drawing us, enveloping us, speaking with us as a friend. A friend of all friends. Amen.
draw near to God and speak with him as a person speaks with a friend and hear him speak with you as a person speaks with a friend. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus. Amen.